All right, you may begin. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the International Health Commission of the African Methodist Episcopal Church to our uh, first of many opportunities of coming together as we talk about and as we plan around the AME Church's uh, farm and garden initiative. We thank God for our uh, commission chair, Bishop Francine Brookins, and our international health director, uh, medical director, Dr. Uh, Reverend Dr. Miriam Burnett and our executive director, Reverend Natalie Mitchum. And so tonight we thank you for joining us. We also ask if you would be so kind to place in the chat your name, uh, your church and your email as we wanna be sure that you are in touch. Uh, we, are, we can stay in touch with you as we grow together. I'm going to ask tonight if Reverend Brenda White will lead us in a word of prayer, after which we'll ask Dr. Burnett to greet us and then we will begin our presentation. Most gracious God, we come tonight across the connection of the AME Church with family and friends and guests and visitors for one purpose. And God, that is to galvanize ourselves around uh, gardening, farming, and sustainability to ensure that we hear from you, follow after you, to ensure to empower our communities that they may eat well, live well, and serve well. We lift this prayer in your strong name and your son, Jesus the Christ, and we say amen. 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 Thank you all so very much for attending uh, today. We are thankful for an opportunity to not just come and talk about uh, the new initiatives for farming, but to be able to talk about where we go next. How do we move to a place where our insecurity, food insecurity, and our food uh, apartheid begins to be vanquished by the fact that we are taking our own initiatives, that we are putting ourselves in a place where we are producing our own food, where we are producing uh, what we need in order to not only eat for ourselves, but assist our communities and to provide an entrepreneurial uh, relationship with our communities and um, our neighboring states, principalities, provinces, counties, wherever we may be, we are thankful for an opportunity to do so. I am also grateful for the leadership of the steering committee headed by the Reverend Carolyn Cavanis and Reverend Brenda White. It is uh, a remarkable thing to watch the two of these women of God move. And so uh, we are being placed back in your hands. Thank you, Dr. Burnett. And again, we thank God for uh, Sister, for, sorry, for Reverend Brenda and all these steering committee members and certainly for your presence tonight. Um, as Dr. Burnett mentioned over um, the course of each month, we will call, come together. And so when you registered, you might have seen that there were other dates were in uh, for you to sign up. So please just plug those dates into your uh, calendar, into your schedules. Uh, we want to take this as an opportunity for networking, but also sharing out information. Um, I know I am on the East Coast, and so we are preparing, our church is preparing for our garden, um, and uh, actually we're going to open on April the 3rd, which will coincide prayerfully with our opening of our sanctuary, which we have not been open in close to two years. And so again, we thank God for you, and we're honored tonight to have with us uh, Mr. Marcus Williams, who is a master gardener, uh, currently the master gardener, home horticultural agent serving Baltimore City, Maryland. Marcus received his MS in food safety and biosecurity from Virginia Tech in 2017 and his BS in plant and soil science from Virginia State University in 2009. He is currently working on his PhD at the University of Maryland College Park in food science. Before moving to Maryland, he worked as an agricultural and natural resource agent with Virginia Cooperative Extension. More recently, he worked for the USDA in Howard County as a soil conservation technician. Before joining the extension, he worked in Maryland's emerging cannabis industry. And so we thought it important to bring 
uh, Mark is with us, uh, certainly to provide us technical support, if you will, and conversation around um, our guard, but also uh, to encourage each of our congregations and institutions to please connect, and Marcus will speak to this, with um, the uh, extension uh, that may be in your immediate area. And so let's give God praise for Mr. Marcus Williams as he will now present to us. Good evening, excuse me. Good evening, everyone. How's everybody doing? Good. 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 <laughs> Good, I hope. So I want to first um, thank you for inviting me. Um, secondly, I I like to tell people that, and sorry you can't see my camera's kind of messing up right now, <clears throat> but I, I like to tell people that when you plant in the ground, when you garden or farming, it is a year-round sport. Just because you're not actively planting in the ground doesn't mean you don't need to be planning for the next time you do. Now, farming, gardening can go as deep as you want it. It can be just putting something in the ground, um, watching it come up, water it, sunlight, and taking the fruits from it, or it could be as deep as getting the knowledge and knowing the science behind it. Agriculture is for everybody. It's for the person that doesn't think they have a green thumb. It's for the person that thinks they have extensive knowledge. It's for everybody. So um, first, again, I work for the um, University of Maryland Extension. So I'll say this, Extension, is in every state in the United States. Basically, Extension is the outreach arm of the um, college in your state, colleges, because Extension is made up of two colleges in every state. So there is a 1862, which is a PWI, predominantly white institution, and there is a 1890, which is a historically black college or university. And they act as sister schools. So say for instance, in Maryland, of course, it is the University of Maryland and the University of Maryland Eastern Shore. And Virginia, of course, is Virginia State and Virginia Tech and so forth and so forth. But this is only, there's an extension in every state, but there's only a two college system um, as far as Pennsylvania, as low as Florida, and as far west as Arkansas Pine Bluff. So I encourage everyone to, when you go to, for your particular state, when you go um, to the World Wide Web and search on the search engine, you can put in your state and you can put in extension services. And then from there, it will, you'll come to a site, whether it be Clemson, whether it be North Carolina State, what have you, and then you can put in your locality. Um, and then from there, you'll be able to find out the people in your specific state who can help you more so. I mean, of course, I can help you, but um, these people are basically the boots on the ground and your state that can give you research-based knowledge when it comes to agriculture, and they can actually come out to your space that you have, and they can actually show you different techniques. So first off, again, the I tell people this and I laugh. Um, when we start in it, so there's spring, there's summer growing, there's fall growing, and there is kind of winter is growing. But if you're planning for a, a spring garden, um, you should initially be starting for the spring garden back in December, because you have to plan from December, January, February, going into March, and then starting in April. But don't worry. Uh, like the song says, I can take you there. I can get you to um, starting on time. So first thing is that you should be taking a soil sample. What a soil sample is, it's a snapshot of your soil. It's basically gonna tell you 
um, what you have going on there and what you might need to put in. Like I tell people, you wouldn't have all the ingredients for a cake and then go to the store and buy all the ingredients again. So vice versa, you wouldn't plant something in the ground and then go buy stuff to plant stuff in the ground for the, for the nutrient side that you already have. So that soil, set, that soil test is gonna give you basically what's going on in your soil. And you can do a soil test through various companies. And again, I can give you that information or you can go to your extensive services and you can get that information. But that soil test is basically gonna tell you what's going on. Excuse me. Next, after you get that soil test, that um, you're gonna enter the planning phase. So you're going to either be growing in the ground, which is 100% fine, or you're going to be growing in raised beds. Those are two different paths. Growing in raised beds does have a initial upfront cost, more so than growing in the ground. Growing, the ground, growing in the ground is gonna be a little bit more uh, labor intensive because um, you're gonna have to battle not only with um, more so ground temperatures and weeds, but you're going to have to contend with your soil type. So both methods are fine. I like to do both methods. Both methods work. So after you decided whether you're gonna do a raised bed or you're going to do growing in the ground, you have to do a selection of what you want to grow. Um, when I work with my children that are in the different programs that I work with, I like to tell them that there's the popular vegetables and then there's the unpopular vegetables. Your unpopular vegetables might be your root vegetables. I like root vegetables, but your turnips, your rutabaga, your carrots, your beets, your radishes, things like that. Those are a lot of the things, and also your brassicas. Those are the things that are grown in the um, spring, the early spring. When you get to the summer, you have kind of your more well-known vegetables. You have your tomatoes, your um, peppers, your um, sweet potatoes, your eggplants. Uh, you do have greens until it gets too hot for them to survive. And then you have going into your fall, which I like to call your second spring, because from August till about October, you can grow anything in that time frame as long as it's reaching maturity within that time frame. What I mean by maturity is, is that it reaches its life cycle. Like you, it goes from seed to fruit bearing in that time period. And if it does that, then you can get anything off of it. Then you have kind of your, um, you have kind of your, your going into winter, which you're still, you're starting to see the appearance again of your, your brassicas, your cabbage, your collards, your kale. And then you go in again with your, um, starting to have your first killing frost, which means it might make your greens a little bit sweeter. And then from there, if you haven't harvested your greens, it's um, kind of too late. And then you go again into your planning phase, getting ready for the next year. So as you see, it all comes full circle. And that's pretty much agriculture in a whole. Now, I myself, I, if you have any specific questions, I can answer them. I kind of thrive off of questions because I can more say, tailor to what you're interested in and what you might be um, wanting to grow versus me just talking. I do better with talking to you. So if you have any questions, comments, concerns, please go ahead and fire away. All right, if you'd like to offer any questions to Marcus, he's available to ask. And we'll also, we'll check if you also wanna place it in the chat. And we thank you, Marcus, for sharing with us. Any questions? Yes, please. Good evening. Of course. Um, Hello. Hi, Marcus. Um, thank you so much for joining us. My question is this. Last year, I started trying to put things out right at um, Good Friday. 
and mm-hmm. then it got really cold again and back mm-hmm. and forth. So I'm having a really hard time determining. I'm living in Brooklyn, New York, determining <clears throat> okay. when is going to be the best time for me to start planting for the summer. I got you. No problem. So um, in agriculture, we have something what's called um, your first frost date and your last frost date. So for you need to contact your extension agent and they'll tell you your last frost feet day for growing in Brooklyn, New York. That means you don't have to worry about any snow or anything um, freezing out your plants. And then from there, that's called your growing degree days. So that'll tell you your frost fruit days. In that time period, you can grow anything. Thank you. No problem. Hi, my name is Lydia, and I'm from the um, Greensboro, North Carolina area. And I just wanted to ask, like, I have an in-garden, um, in-ground garden, but also a raised bed, but they're small. So I just wanted to see what kind of tips you have for, like, maybe what type of um, vegetables might be best for a garden, and how can I maximize my space? Because I was a little concerned about putting the plants too close together that might cause, you know, diseases or that type of thing. But if you can help me with, hey, what's good tips for when you have a small, you know, space and you want to maximize your harvest? Okay. So when you have a small space, a lot of times people go to the square foot method. Basically, for your space, you have to map out. Basically, you're going to have a vegetable every square foot in your garden. So the easiest way I can tell people is to take a string and kind of, do the dimensions of your space and then take a piece of string and put it um, every square foot from there and then take another string at the bottom. So start at the side, put string across and then start at the bottom, put string from the bottom to the top and every every square, you're gonna be able to plant something. So if you're worried about space, as long as you stay in that square foot, your space requirements will be fine. Okay, thank you. My pleasure. I saw a question in the chat. Sorry. Um, what are, so it was a question for Baltimore, Maryland. What are the best crops to grow in Baltimore area and raised beds that will produce a high yield? Good question. So the um, answer to that is, what are your what space are you working with, and then we can kind of determine what would be pressed. So tomatoes, of course, are high yielders. Um, potatoes, of course, are high yielders. Um, sweet potatoes, of course, are high yielders. Anything can be a high yielder. So the way that we determine what yields good and what doesn't yield good is the variety. So the variety. So there's so there's corn. And out of corn, there's um, silver lining. Silver lining is a good producer of corn. Say, for instance, tomatoes. Tomatoes, you might look for cherry tomatoes, which have which are a little bit smaller. Or if you're looking for a a fuller tomato, you might you might want to go with a better boy. A better boy is a good variety. But if you're in Baltimore area, you can definitely come out of office, or I could come by your area or I can email you and I can send you what works specifically for Baltimore, Maryland. I think we have a, a never question, six by two. So a six by two space, you would, you would be worried about space. And what that does, that might limit you in the amount of things you can put in that space. Like you might want to go for, um, you can do three tomatoes across, and that would make sure that three determinants. The reason why I say there's two different types of tomatoes. There's indeterminates and determinants. The difference being is indeterminates, they don't get, they can get as tall as six feet and as wide as five feet. So you want determinate tomatoes for your space, being they only get a certain size, they only get a certain height, but the drawback is they only yield a certain amount of tomatoes. And once they yield those tomatoes, they're done for the year. 
So with your space requirements, I would do determined tomatoes and I could do three and I would do three across and having at least a six inch, six inches in between each tomato would give you enough room to do that. The, there's another question is, is there a website where we can go to and find out what produces best for our region? Um, your extension services website would be very good for that. Um, again, you would just go to your specific extension service and you would, um, like you would say, Virginia Cooperative Extension, or you would say Maryland Extension, or North Carolina Extension. And from there, it'll tell you what your area, and then when, from there, you can look up your specific county or city. And then from there, they can have, they'll have tips and tricks and also yield um, data for specific, for specific vegetables in your area. Uh, the next question is, what is the best size for raised beds we're doing too? Okay. So <clears throat> you, if you are you also working with youth, if you're working with youth, you want to make sure that they can reach the middle from any side of the bed so they don't have to walk into the bed. The same thing with you. You want to make sure you can reach the middle of the bed from any side so you're not stepping on any soil or you're stepping on any vegetables. Of course, with soil, you have to worry about compaction. With vegetables, you have to worry about stepping on the plants. Uh, so I would, oh, youth, yep. So you want to make sure they, they're able to reach it from every side. Um, how deep should the soil in your raised bed be? That depends on what you're growing. If you're growing something like potatoes, I would do my raised beds at least 20 inches deep. If you're doing something like carrots, you want your bed at least 15 inches deep. If you're doing something like um, tomatoes, you want the same thing, 15 inches. If you're doing something, a deep crop, like a um, potato, a sweet potato, you at least have, you have at least 20 to 25 inches of bed, because once you plant it down, that plant has to also go down with its roots. So you want to take, so you want to take an account of that as well. Um, is pressure treated lumber safe to use in raised beds? Are there any varnish or finishes that you would or would not recommend using with pressure treated wood? <clears throat> so pressure treated wood, as long as it's pressure treated um, just with uh, water, it's fine. But if you have pressure treated wood, it's pressure treated with uh, creosote. It's spelled, again, don't kill me, but it's uh, C-R-E-S-O-N, creosote. That shouldn't be still used but if it is still used and you get lumber with that that's that it will leach into your raised beds and in turn leach into your vegetables and you want don't want to use them i would say if you can use something um along the lines of cedar or or high pressure press pressure treated wood i would do that but i would also be wary of using anything that leaches into your soul i mean into your soul so creosote creosote or anything like landscaping fabric that's pressure treated, I just be careful of anything leaking into it. The farmer's almanac, yeah, the farmer's almanac is a good resource for resource for zone planning. I will also look at the USDA's hardness zones. Basically what that tells you is what grows in your area. So I know that um, Maryland in the specific Baltimore area is a 7 um, A, 7 B. I know Virginia, um, the Virginia Beach area is an 8. The Hampton Roads area is a 7 A. The Richmond area is anywhere between a 7 A to a 6. North Carolina, you have areas that are 8s, 7s, and 6. And going forth down south, the it gets the zones go higher because it's a higher temperature, vice versa. If you're going north, you go with six, you go with, you have a six, you have a five, but that USDA hardness zone will tell you especially what you're looking for. The next question is, do we need a liner for raised beds? Do you like weeds? If you don't like weeds, you do need a liner. 
So you can use newspaper, you can use cardboard, you can use anything of that nature. But I would always be, I would always have something as a barrier between you and the ground for the simple fact that anything anywhere where there is not a weed the good lord will put anything the good lord will put a weed there something will grow there so if you don't have something growing there something will grow there so having that liner actually helps put a barrier between you and the soil uh question what do the zones mean good ask good question so the zones mean what you can what basically your year-round temperature is so um, the zones basically tell you what you can and what you can't grow. Like if you live in a seven, you can't grow something for a zone one because they have different climate restrictions. They want though something in a zone one wants colder climate versus something in the seven wants a milder climate. So like vice versa, if you are in a seven, you can't grow something zoned for a nine because your climate isn't hot enough. So basically the zones tell you your temperature and what can grow and what can't grow in your area. Uh, the next question is maybe we have some reason to include resources. Yes. So um, if I have your, um, if I I can email it to the moderator of the um, the meeting, I can email them a host of information, and then they can pass it on to you. Um, or vice versa, if you have a specific question that you would like to ask me, you can email it to this email. I have a question. Um, yes, ma'am. This, this is Linda Bryant. I was wondering in regards to planting um, herbs like uh, the cilantro, peppermints alongside of the vegetables, your tomatoes or greens, or will it have any impact on um on either taste. or the taste of it like you know uh bitterness or anything like that if you any cross pollination with with the uh, those kinds of herbs good question so that come again I, as i said agriculture can get as deep as you want it or it could just be just putting things to the ground so what you're talk, asking and talking about is companion crop growing basically what goes with what. Like um, you don't plant tomatoes and potatoes together because they stunt the growth of each other. And plus they're in the same family. Um, you don't grow, you might grow the three sisters. The three sisters are pumpkins, corn, and uh, beans together. Those three things go together. So what you're going into is companion planting. I have a companion planting guide that I could um, send and that could be useful for everybody to know what goes with what and what repels what. So you'll know kind of, okay, I want to, and what that is, is interplanting. Basically um, saying, okay, I want to plant uh, basil with my tomatoes and the basil will make the tomatoes sweeter and you can kind of interplant them between each other. That works as well. Awesome, thank you. Pleasure, pleasure. There are two questions on the Facebook live stream. One oh, is, okay. what about bag gardens? Mm -hmm. And the other one bag is, okay, go ahead. I'll take them one. Oh, no. one uh, <laughs> okay, bag gardening is 100% fine. Um, you can grow tomato. What it does is it gives you you can plant one thing in that bag. Um, you just got to make sure at the end of the year, once you're finished or at the end of the season, once you're finished with that crop, you have to change out that uh, soil because either all the nutrients in that soil have been used up or you don't want to have any disease resting in that bed. So if you have a pothole in your ground and you have anything else in your ground or you have a space where you have bare ground, just kind of dump that soil out and start over with new soil. But bad garden is good specifically for if you're gonna do mushrooms. Mushrooms can grow in bags. Um, I tell people, try everything. As long as it's for your zone, but try everything. Um, the only 
make the only mistake you'll make if you don't try. You'll miss all the shots you take, i.e., you will miss all the plants you don't plant. Um, next question. It's uh, really a statement, but I'm going to ask mm -hmm. it. I'm going to um, make the statement and then ask, what do we do about this? The statement is, I have a liner, but groundhogs pull it out. Um, mm. So my question I would add tag onto that it would be, and so what do we do about that? Okay, you have to take the food source away from that groundhog. That groundhog is there because, so there's two things. So groundhogs, and if you ever heard of voles, they kind of roll in pairs. So um, moles and voles and groundhogs, they all use the same um, holes. So a mole might come through and make the hole, a vole will come home, come through and use the hole, and a groundhog would, groundhog, groundhog would use that hole as well. So the groundhog and the vole are eating the bottoms of your vegetables. Like if you have roots there, they're eating those roots. Um, the mole is there because he's eating the grubs that you have in your ground. So if you get rid of their food source, they have no reason to be there anymore. They might just go to your neighbor's yard, but if you have their food source come back, they'll come back. Are, marig are marigolds good for keeping bugs away from your vegetables? Or? Marigolds are good for, they're a good determinant for some things. They're good for soft body insects, but they're, not, they're good for like, if you want to keep away white flies or same things like that, but they don't address like a, um, a stink bug or anything hard body, like a, a, um, a ladybug or a, um, gosh, I can't think of the name of the other bug, but they don't do well for hard, for hard body bugs. Okay. A uh, question in the chat is, what's the best way to close down a raised bed and reuse the soil? Perfect answer. All right, so I actually did this with uh, Pastor Brown um, at one of, at like three of these churches. So the way we do that is you use the soil for the year. This is So you do this when you don't want to use the bed for a season or you're closing down the bed for the year. So we want to um, add the amendments that we want to. We want to add some um, manure or compost to it. Um, I'm very partial to cow manure, uh, but yeah. we want to add the manure to it. We want to add the um, any kind of lime or any kind of nutrients that you want to add to it. You want to cover it up with black plastic. You want to staple down the black plastic. You want to nail it down to the corner so it can't come up. And what that does is the sun is going to sanitize that soil. It's going to sanitize that soil. So when you're ready to pull that um, black plastic off of it, it's right as rain and it's ready to go. You don't have to worry about any critters getting in there. You don't have to worry about any birds pooping in there and having any weed seeds. That soil will be ready to go. Um, question was, with regards to zoning, does that mean that historically politicians have intensely rezoned predominantly Black communities in order to prevent us from growing our own food? Um, no, that's not the case with growing zones. We just now, that's not the case with growing zones, but I will say this, they have depleted our soils they have taken like the, so our soils have different layers. You have your O, which is your organic zone, your organic um, layer, then you have your A. This is where all the action takes place. This is where your earthworms are. This is where all your microbes are. This is where your topsoil is. A lot of places when they build different structures, they strip off that topsoil and they sell it back to you or they give it to somebody else. So in historically places that are brown or um, black areas, they have done this. Um, and they've also poisoned our, our soil as well. And they also, people who are of color usually reside in places that are not considered prime farmland. Um, there's an app, there's a, a website that you use called the Soil Map that basically tells you what your soil is, and people who have color usually don't reside on soil that is considered to be prime farmland 
or prime swollen. It produces, but it's not the best. Uh, next question is, any type of men is good to plant alone due to aggressive, due to aggressive they spread. Correct. So I say that with all herbs. Um, herbs spread, herbs want to be everywhere. So what I do is I take a container and I plant the herbs in that container, and then I plant the herb, then I plant the container and the herbs in the ground, and that keeps it from spreading. It's only going to spread to that area. It can't go no farther than the container, but it's because it's confined in the container. But if you plant it directly in the ground, it's going to spread out. But if you keep it confined to that container, it'll stay in that area. Uh, I have a small box. It's about four by four. And I had mm -hmm. some success with uh, cherry tomatoes last year. I mean, I had a gazillion. But this mm -hmm. year, I want to put something else in that box. What would be compatible with like uh, a cherry, not a cherry, but a tomato plant? What could I put in there like from an herb point of view? Herb, I would use definitely basil. Basil Thank works. You. Um, you can do um, something like cilantro. You can do something as a mint you can do just about anything you just want to make sure that excuse me you want to make sure that you don't plant something in that same family so the family that tomatoes are in of course is the nightshade family so the companion guide i will um i'll pass along to you kind of make kind of tells you what goes with what or what's friends with this or what's his friend or what's his foe so you'll know specifically what works and what doesn't work good good thank you my pleasure uh next question is my church owns land that was a landfill would it be wise to use grow boxes instead of growing the ground good question so there's two ways you can go about this. One is you can have a soil tested and see what contaminants are in there. And you can see how far those contaminants go down. But growing in raised beds kind of kind of eliminates that need for doing deep testing. But still, if you're going to grow above the ground, I would still be cautious and put down a a liner because you don't want what's in, in that soil kind of working its way up. And things like brassicas, which are your lettuces, um, your kale, your collards, things like those, and those absorb what's in the ground very heartily. So I would be kind of leery because I want this I want basically the soil to be tested first to make sure my uh, vegetables aren't taking up any contaminants that are in the soil that might leach anything anything that's in the subsoil that might leach from the subsoil to the top soil. There was a comment on crop rotation. That's a hundred. So the so crop rotation is something that you should be doing in your months when you're not planting. When you're not planting, you should be planning. You should be saying, what am I going to grow next year? How am I going to grow next year? Where am I going to grow next year? Who's going to help me grow? Because the thing is, the two hardest parts are the actually putting things in the ground and the actually harvesting because two people can maintain a big large area but you need manpower to harvest and you need manpower to put things in so during that time downtime that you have when you're not actually growing you should be also saying okay i grew this this year well what am i going to put behind that or vice versa i grew this this season what am i going to grow next season and make sure, making sure that I'm not going to grow anything that diseases can hop from one plant to the other plant, i.e. because you don't want to plant things that are in the same family behind each other. So if you had um, disease on your tomato plants, you don't want to grow anything that the tomatoes can hop from one plant to the next plant. 
the you have a question how viable is it to add wildflowers as a pond in for your garden immensely so i tell people that pollinators are a hundred percent necessary um you might not like bees but bees actually pollinate the vest a lot of the vegetables that we uh consume butterflies do as well birds do as well um bats do as well and also humans do as well well because they either are feeding on the pollen or they brush up against the pollen and they help pollinate the vegetables that we know and love so i encourage everybody if you have a raised bed or if you have a garden area put a pot put some pollinator plants in there put some wildflowers put some um anything that attracts pollinators um again i can um give you the website of your local extension and they have a area where they talk about pollinators and how pollinators are beneficial to what we do and what we and what we eat of course um if you're starting to if you're starting to compost or you have a compost area be cognizant of what you put in there so you want to make sure you put in no meat, no dairy, nothing with any oils. Um, you want to put, you don't want to put any dead animals, even though I do know some places they compost dead animals, but they have the space to do that. Um, you want to make sure that you have your ratio. The ratio is green, which of course is your chopped up vegetables or your um, grass clippings or something like that, but you also have to have your brown with that, which is your leaves, your paper bags, your um, anything that you would consider to be brown. And you want to make sure you have the right mixture because if you have too much green, you'll start to have a smelly compost area. If you have too much brown, your compost will burn through its reserves super quick. So you want to make sure that you have a nice mixture and I can tell you I can actually I can send you along with the information I'm already going to send you I can send you a how to compost starter guide and there's different types of composting there is traditional composting and then when you want to get a little bit more technical there is what's called uh, vermiculture vermiculture is basically um, using worms to compost and basically the worms um, eat your kitchen scraps and then they um, basically poop out uh, what you don't have and then the secretion kind of goes through the different levels in your composting compost and you can actually make um, what people call compost tea out of that or the castings from the worm you can make um, worm castings out of that so again like i said in the beginning gardening or farming can be as light as you want or as deep as you want it all depends on where your interests are i don't see okay. any more questions in the chat but again i um can def I'm definitely going to send the moderator um, the information that I promised on getting started. And um, I definitely put my email in the chat. So if you have any specific questions, comments, or concerns, I can answer them. Coffee grinds, eggshells are also I answer that. Correct. Any food scraps, any kitchen scraps, as long as they don't have any oil or any salad dressing um are definitely good to add to compost also on a different note if your garden is deficient in different uh vitamins like specifically if you're if you're if you see black spots on the bottom of your tomatoes your garden is deficient in calcium what you can take is you can take um eggshells you can ground them up and you can put them into your soil and that'll help with your deficiency in your um garden that'll help with your calcium deficiency again being a gardener is like almost being a detective you have to 
know what's going on with your plan. Most times, your plan will tell you what's wrong. Your plan will tell you if I'm not getting enough water, if I'm getting too much water. Um, it'll turn purple if you don't have phosphorus. It'll turn light yellow if it's deficiency, deficient in nitrogen. Your garden is going to tell you what's wrong and what's not wrong. And one last thing, the difference between um, if you're not a big fan of growing weed, if you're not a big fan of pulling weeds, um, a raised bed is more so the way to go. If you don't mind pulling weeds, which I don't because my mother had me out there every Saturday pulling weeds out of a landscape. So I'm kind of accustomed to pulling weeds, but if you don't mind growing in the ground, then weeds are the way to go. But I, I, I say this and I say this with all actuality, if you have bare spots in your garden, the Lord's going to put something there. He's going to, whether it's a weed you don't want there, it's a weed you do want there, he's going to put something there. So you have to make sure you have, if you don't have things in the proper areas, something's going to grow there that you want, that you don't want. How long does it take to pull up the weeds? How many hours? <laughs> Too many hours. Um, Technology is getting a lot better where um, they have either, they have machines, I mean, kind of like hand machines where you can do a hand pull. Um, it's a hand puller where you can kind of step on it and pull back and the week comes back. Or if you are feeling super confident in your skills, they do have um, basically flames that you can use. Basically, you hook a propane tank up to a flame and you can kind of burn the flame. It kind of burn the um, weed out. Um, if you don't have even one of those, you can use hot water, scalding hot water at least up to 250 degrees. You can pour on the weeds, but you have to make sure they don't touch your plants because, of course, they're going to scorch your plant as well. And it takes repeated applications of that to do it. But that's a way that you don't have to worry about any pesticides on your crops. Easy. So um, the question is, how would you replace nitrogen in an organic garden? So you would use, so instead of using outright nitrogen, like urea or something like that, you would use something along the lines of bat guanu, which is bat poop. You would lose, use bat poop or something that could be a substitute for nitrogen. Nitrogen is a weird element for the simple fact that nitrogen is highly volatile, which means that it doesn't stay in the soil for long. So you want something with um, a high first, so you want something with a high first number. So when you see your fertilizers, it has three numbers. The first number is nitrogen, the second number is potassium, and the third number is phosphorus. You want something that is a high first number. It's okay. Second, so the next question is: Is there a natural, God-provided way to preserve plants, animals, and gardens besides pesticides, antibiotics, and antibiotics? Of course, there is. So again, you can go with the you can go, which is basically going the organic route as far as plants are concerned. But the thing is, and don't let anybody lie to you: there are pesticides. They might not be. There's a difference between pesticides is a word that people have dirtified. Basically, anything you use is a pesticide. The only difference is whether it's organic pesticide, which is natural, or a synthetic pesticide, which is man-made. Those are, so everything is still a pesticide. It's the difference between organic or synthetic. So organic would be something that's um, cinnamon-based um, or something that is a salt base, something like that. That's an organic pesticide versus on the other end of synthetic, you may have Roundup. The active ingredient in Roundup is, um, gosh, it just slipped my head as fast as it came, but it has an active ingredient that was man-made, which it could be 2,4-D or it could be dicamba, anything of that nature. So that's the difference between synthetic and organic. What's the difference between, somebody asked the question, what's the difference between organic and synthetic? 
it's the simple, so basically it's the active ingredient. It's the active ingredient natural, which is it comes from the earth, whether it's um, using copper or using um, cinnamon or using a salt base or, be, or using something that comes from basically the earth or using something synthetic, which is something like a MCPP or a um, dicamba based. Or those things are synthetic and they were made in a lab. They do their purposes and they work. Me being, of course, a scientist, I think that's interesting, but there are long-term ramifications that haven't been studied with those instruments. Question is, what is the question you wish the gardener knew? So the, the biggest Thing I wish that every gardener knew is that gardening is for you. Um, no matter what somebody might say, no matter if somebody says that this is for the good old boys, it's not. It's, it's for you. And it's not that hard. It's as it's, it's easy as you want to make it to be. Blood meal. Blood meal is awesome. Um, blood meal works, of course, you can use bad guano, you can use um, other instruments that other types of organic uh, fertilizers that work. Copy, uh, earlier question was, would chicken poop work? Yes, chicken poop would work, but the thing you have to worry about with using any animal manure is how long it's aged. Chicken poop needs at least half a year to age because you have all that nitrogen in the um, excrement that could harm your plant. So basically it needs to age over time. And as it ages, the, um, the natural elements, the natural fertilizer in it kind of evens out. But I would still, what I would do is you can go to your extension services and you can get them to do a nutrient test on your aged uh, manure, just to make sure it's not gonna harm your plant. Um, the next question is, man-made science that goes against God's nature, does not work. We need to submit to God's science. I understand. Um, we do need to submit to God's science, but the thing is, unfortunately, we've gotten to a tipping point that, Things get when things get to a certain point that we do need to rely on the science. Like if you get a hundred stink bugs in your yard, unless you're picking them off by hand, you need something to get rid of them quicker. But if things are organically grown, that makes things so much easier. And if the if it starts from the end, if it starts from the beginning doing that, the things are a lot grown a lot easier. Or using a what's called uh, IPM, basically integrated pest management, basically using all the tools that are necessary to deal with any weed or pest. And then at the end, if there's no other solution, no other way, you go to something synthetic, but something synthetic shouldn't be your first use. There's a hundred different solutions you can use before you have to go to something synthetic. So next question is, I've always wanted to, I've always been interested in becoming a master gardener. Fizz, can this extensive service uh, provide me with this information? Of course. So right now I am the Master Gardener Coordinator for Baltimore City. There is a Master Gardener Coordinator in every city, county, or state that you may go in. So all you have to do is go to that extensive website and they will tell you specifically how to become a Master Gardener. Uh, the next question is how do you get rid of grass burrs ah yes so you can use a lot of different ways you can use something called acetyl acid which is basically will get down and systemically kill the um grass you can use hot water but again you have to use um you have to apply that over and over again but that will eventually kill the grass um, you can, of course, again, using that integrated pest management, you can pull those weeds out. But that is a, a seasonal weed. So you really most time only deal with that seasonally. 
So attacking it before, my biggest thing is attacking it before it grows. So if you know that we only comes up a certain time of year, be proactive and putting down things that will combat that weed. So you, if you have any rhubarb leaves, you can boil the rhubarb leaves. You can, after that, you can strain the, the liquid out of that. You can let it sit overnight and you can use that spray to kill weeds. But I, I always tell people this, there's a whole bunch of different options out there. You just have to be willing to look at those different options. <laughs> somebody, somebody said pulling is not an option. Two degrees, and I understand that 100%. So if pulling is not an option, we have to take it, integrate it, um, pest management, look at it and basically say, okay, if pulling is not an option, what's my next option? And then from there, what's my next option? Um, you can go the organic route and use organic sprays. Again, organic pesticide sprays. Again, remember what I said, organic does not mean harmful. Pest I mean, sorry, let me correct that. Pesticide does not mean harmful. It's the difference between using something that's organic, which is natural, and something that's synthetic, which is not natural or man-made. So we had to take that word out of our vocabulary. Um, it does not. Uh, the question was, does boiling tomato and, uh, tomatoes and potatoes leaves work as well? They do not. They don't have that um, acid inside their leaves. Uh, rhubarb, you have to look for something that has the oxidal acid in it, and rhubarb leaves do have the oxidal acid in it. So if you find something, I can't think of off the time I had anything besides rhubarb that does have that acid in the leaves, but if you find something with the acetyl acid, that definitely works. But tomato and potato leaves don't work. All righty. Well, thank you so much, Marcus. And uh, Reverend Brenda, would you like to say a word? Thank you, Dr. Cabinets, and thank you all who are here. Marcus, I wanna thank you uh, so much. Uh, for your wealth of knowledge. When I saw your camera couldn't come on, I said, oh Lord, but I thank you uh, because of what you have done and what you are doing. And I personally thank you as one who lives in Baltimore. Uh, my brothers and my sisters, Marcus and his crew worked with us for 18 months uh, to establish our garden pathway forward in Baltimore. We're in urban Baltimore. I mean, you can't get much more urban than we are on West Lexington Street and we were able to grow just a plethora of vegetables and, uh, and, and, and fruit, uh, even handheld watermelons. But we stood out from the, uh, from the heat to the rain, the snow and COVID outside, but we were able to get it done. And my brother, I thank you so much for all that you bring to the table. And I thank you for connecting with Dr. Cavanis and getting us the information that we need. We thank you so much uh, in Baltimore. My pleasure, my pleasure. I uh, definitely here to help when the spring starts, when the summer, uh, when <laughs> next fall, all I am is an email away. You know, I will come to your area and help. Thank you. And what we will do, and we thank you, Marcus. Um, so all of the different resources that Marcus uh, spoke of, um, you will receive an email. So please be sure if you joined us later on, please be sure that we have your name, your congregation and your best email address so we can be sure to stay in touch with you. As we bring our time together to a close uh, um, and we thank God for the presence of our commission chair, uh, Bishop Francine Brookins, and we are going to ask that she will uh, greet us and also if it's okay, Bishop, um, if you also will uh, give us our parting prayer for the evening, but we will also in the email that goes out, 
We'll have information for churches who are um, establishing new gardens this growing season uh, to take advantage of resources available by way of the Black Church Food Security Network. And so at our next section uh, in March, we will share more. Uh, please stay in touch. If we can be of any assistance to you, please do. But please, again, be sure that we have your name, congregation, and email address in the chat. So we will be sending you uh, some further information. And again, let us rise in our spirit uh, for Bishop Brookins. Amen. Greetings and blessings to everyone. Once again, uh, these sessions that you put on um, specifically with this ministry are some of the most life-giving things that I participate in, in all of my days. Um, and so I just want to thank you again for this outstanding ministry to the Health Commission, Dr. Burnett, uh, and um, to each of you who are gathered here asking such sophisticated questions while I'm sitting back going, oh my God, I'm not composting worms. And no, no, this is all too much. I've gone too far. I'm coming to your garden. Uh, but it is so exciting to know that we are growing together. And I have been making comments in the chat about the outstanding presenter today, who I will just call Reverend Marcus, the Bishop of Gardening, um, who has presented to us today in such an excellent manner with scientific responses to, uh, like I said, very sophisticated questions that you all have been asking. So I'm excited to know that we are growing together and that we have this resource and to have learned all the things that I learned today. I feel like I need to go and at least get some sort of planter box going outside. Um, <laughs> we are growing this ministry in the 18th Episcopal District where uh, we are presiding right now in Lesotho in Eswatini, which is formerly Swaziland in Botswana and in South Mozambique. And we're just beginning this ministry there. So we are um, excited and I'm listening and I'm wondering, and I'm sure Dr. Burnett knows about the growing zone areas and how they are impacted and what, what food recommendations uh, there may be differences in when we're in the United States versus when we're in different parts of the continent. So um, let me again just say thank you, thank you, thank you for allowing me to uh, learn and grow with you as part of this outstanding ministry and encourage all of you to spread the word about this. We are increasingly in a time where we will need to fend for ourselves. And so this kind of resource, the ability to grow a potato wherever you may find yourself uh, may really be life-saving for your entire community. Um, Reverend White, you are outstanding, been outstanding and a warrior uh, always. And so uh, thank you, thank you for what you bring and the passion that you bring to this ministry. Um, am I supposed to hand this off to Dr. Burnett or am I supposed to close us in prayer? You're supposed to close this in prayer. Okay. All right. Uh, again, um, Marcus, thank you. Thank you. You are a walking wealth of wisdom. And so uh, we thank you for sharing it, uh, some of it with us. Let us pray. God, our God, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. We come now hungry, starving, in need of fresh food all over the world. We thank you for giving us bits and pieces of the Garden of Eden dwelling within our souls. We thank you for planting growing wisdom in ordinary people that we might be able to plant and to grow and to harvest and to do it in your name because we do love you and we desire to feed your sheep and we desire to eat. We pray now, oh God, for all places that are war-torn, for every child who is terrified and every parent who is horrified, 
and every person who has had to become a soldier. We thank you for equipping us to fight spiritually and physically and with food. Bless us, bless our presenters, and bless this ministry, God. Grant us increase. In the name of Jesus, we pray and ask it all, and we thank you in advance. Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. Please stay safe. We thank God for you, and we will be in touch. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.